Good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for attending the much anticipated launch for the Quality of Life Framework. I'm Kate Honey from Portland and have had the pleasure of working with the foundation over the past year to build a wonderful network of industry leaders, designers and thinkers, many of whom have come together to create this fantastic piece of work. This piece of work is, could not have been come at a more pivotal point in time, and it's a true signpost for positive change in the industry. I'm going to pass over to Professor Sadie Morgan, founder of the foundation, who'll be chairing the panel event shortly. But before I do, there are a few quick digital housekeeping points. Firstly, you'll notice a little Q&A box on the bottom left hand of your screen. Please put any questions you have for the panelists here and we'll try to answer them all in the second half. Secondly, the panelists will... Sorry, the, the event will be recorded and will be available on the Foundation's website in the coming days. Thirdly, the framework and case studies will also be on this page as downloads, just in case you'd like to refer to them during the session. And finally, please do share the event via your social channels if you wish. The icons are at the bottom of the screen and you should link directly to Twitter, LinkedIn and so on. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Sadie and thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to everybody watching uh, and or listening at home and to my esteemed panelists who I will introduce in a moment. I'm Sadie Morgan, the founding director of DRMM Architects, one of the 10 members of the National Infrastructure Commission, a mayor's design advocate and board member at Homes England and you and I. However, today I'm very happy and proud to appear as your chair of the Quality of Life Foundation, an independent organization started a year and a half ago in the belief that we should make people and their well-being central to the way we create and care for our homes and communities. And what a year and a half it's been. Few of us will have predicted the pandemic and its effects, but successive lockdowns have exposed just how important our homes and communities are to our quality of life as never before. From the health of inequalities of those people living in cramped or inadequate housing to the freedoms and frustrations, <laughs> I certainly have had them, of working at home and the resilience shown by countless communities up and down the country. The good news to come out of all this is there is a sense of urgency across industry and government to involve people in conversations about where they live, to understand what they value and what they need from their homes and local areas. And it's in the spirit of those conversations that we've carried out our work with the extensive research and quality of life framework published this week that demonstrates just what quality of life in the built environment means and how it might be encouraged by everybody involved. The response so far has been absolutely amazing, and I'd like to give huge thanks to the, Qualf, the Quality of Life team. I call it, we call it Qualf. Quality of Life team in particular, Matthew and Beth, our partners, collaborators, our incredible board, and the residents who've helped shape our work, with a special thanks, of course, to Barclay Group and the late Tony Pidgeley, who's, without whose generous support and vision this would have not been possible. But the framework is very much the beginning rather than the end of our work. In the next few years, we will focus on finding mechanisms that affect real change through the collective uplift, engaging communities, increasing accountability, and promoting better models of development. And one final word. We received a message today saying that residents in Moss Side who have got their hands on a copy of the framework have set up a study group to run through each chapter and see how they can adapt and apply it to their area. Proof, if it were needed, that people do really care about where they live and that they want to be involved in making it better. And so on to our panelists. We have David Rudland, who is a director of the Urban Design Practice Urbed, past chair of the Academy of Urbanism and honorary professor at Manchester University. He was one of the principal authors of the UK's National Model Design Code, published in January this year, and in 2014 was the winner of the esteemed Wolfson Economic Prize. Deborah Cadman, OBE, became Chief Executive of the West Midlands Combined Authority in September 2017, following over 30 years in public service. I can't believe that, Deborah. <laughs> don't know, you don't, look, you don't look old enough to have done 20. <laughs> anywhere near that. She is a trustee of the Joseph Rowntree Trust and Joseph Rowntree Housing Foundation, Commissioner for the Smart Government Commission, and recently joined the Reform Advisory Board. Dan Labad joined the Crown Estates in December 2019 as the Chief Executive. He has a long history of working in the development sector, previously as Chief Exec Executive of Lendlease Europe. 
His passion for sustainability started when he was working for the Hornery Institute, a non-for-profit organization established by Lend-Lease employees and shareholders, but I know how passionate he is about this subject. He is an active, active champion of sustainability, having previously served as a director on the General Green Building Council of Australia and as the chairman of the UK Green Building Council. And last but nowhere least, Bridget Rosewell, CBE, is an experienced director, policymaker, and economist with a track record in advising public and private sector clients on key strategic issues. She is a commissioner for the National Infrastructure Commission in the UK and has been senior independent director of Network Rail and chief economic advisor to the Greater London Authority. She has also climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro with me, but that's for another time. So um, welcome, everybody. I have, uh, as you would expect, a few questions to sort of get us kicked off and started with. The first is going to go to David. So David, Erbed was the primary author of the Quality of Life Framework and did, an, I have to say, an excellent job in doing so, uh, a real um, outstanding uh, piece of work. You'd expect me to say that. That's not scripted. Um, you, you were also responsible for the recent National Design Code. So, David, how, how do these pieces of work correspond and how will they influence the wider industry trends, do you think? Thank you, Sadie. Um, I, I was shocked to realise the other day that I'd actually worked for Urbed for 30 years, let alone um, being, being in public service. So we, we've poured that much, all that experience into the, into the framework um, of working with communities o over all that time. I mean, I think um, we've been working on the, the code and the, the framework at, at the same time, absolutely simultaneously, and, and, and uh, quite this, a huge overlap between them in terms of the subject matter. I think there's three important differences, um, which I think is, is relevant. The, the, the first is that um, in doing the National Model Design Code, we were confined to work within existing government policy. And and lots of things we'd like to have gone beyond that, but we couldn't, whereas with the framework, of course, we were able to do that. So we're able to say how we think should be rather than just where the policy allows us to go at the moment. Um, the second thing is the code was all about planning. And, you know, as a planner, obviously, I think planning is vitally important, but it's not everything. And the, the, the framework goes goes way beyond planning. It goes into, into a whole range of, of, of social issues and community issues, which planners, um, however well-intentioned, can't deal with. So it, it's much more wider in scope. And the third reason, I think, is that the, the code is, is it targeted at local authorities, and this framework is very definitely targeted at communities. Um, it's a different audience. It's written in a different way. And it's also much more focused on what communities can do. I think both of the documents, are about how we make change happen. Um, we, I think, generally agree now on what we think good looks like in terms of quality of life and urban environments, but we're not very good at producing it. The code is one way of producing that through the planning system. The framework is a very different way of producing it. But they both basically answer that question. How do we bring this about? How do we empower communities to change the quality of life in their area? And as I say, this, when we're writing, we're very concerned with the framework to make it action-orientated, to include sections on what can you do um, and hopefully ha um, Hafsa in our office is the person in my side who's introduced it to that group and hopefully there is really practical stuff in there that communities can and can take and run with. Thank you I think this point about um, you know making something that's practical and you know that that it really does enable change in the way that you you know that we all we also desperately need and does it in a way that I think doesn't um, it, it really feels tangible? You know, I think if, if for those of you who's look, who've looked at the case studies, they really are a really good cross section um, of, uh, of, of of examples of things that I think can you know can be done in a way that uh, um, that everybody I think would would feel empowered to do. De Deborah. The framework, I think, comes at a pivotal time, of course, and we've had some early conversations with policymakers about the possibilities for the framework to be used to incite change in the long term, much as what um, David was talking about. But how do you think this could be led from a local or uh, regional authority, such as the West Midlands Combined Authority? How, how is it that you think you can take this and, and help to affect change? Um, thanks, Sadie. I think the first thing to say is... Um, the timing of this is, is impeccable, the launch of this, because I think the pandemic has caused all of us to just rethink how we live our lives, actually, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, 
And local government, the combined authority and local government is starting to think about how it recovers from the pandemic. And it's not just about economic recovery, it's also got to be about community recovery as well. And we're, we're starting to be quite creative about how we do that. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see that examples from the West Midlands are highlighted as, as best practice because we are kind of waving around our magic wand and saying, OK, let's let's put right a lot of wrongs, but actually let's start from a different place in the way in which we support our communities and our economies. But I think we've been looking at recovery and reset on three different levels, actually. So the first one is, is in our heads, isn't it? So um, it's about recognising the importance of, of mental health to our resilience uh, and, more importantly, our happiness and quality of life. So I really welcome how this framework um, brings us back to the simple question of what brings us joy and happiness and what's really important to us. Um, and also thinking about the role that local government, regional government can play in supporting them. And then the second level really is about um, uh, how we see the world out of our windows. And we've all, I think we've all gained a real appreciation of, of the power of nature as we take our daily walks, as, as we kind of spend time with family and friends in a park or for, uh, for Birmingham's uh, example, a longer canal. Um, so it's really great that this framework gives us practical guidance about how we can make our green, our urban spaces as green as, as possible. And then the third level really is about our high streets. And, and we're all thinking about how our city centres can recover within the context of, of seeing our local high streets begin to thrive and uh, improve and the way people are using local shops a, a lot more so but we also know that that our high streets and city centers are far more than just bricks and mortar uh, so there's some really exciting conversations being had about how we can bring those centers uh where people meet um to be a lot more than just just retail and and i think that's really really exciting the framework gives us a really good guidance a set of invaluable guidance about how we can do that and bring them back to life in, in, in the right way. And then, and then finally, really, there's lots of conversation at the moment about levelling up and what that looks like. And, and a lot of it is around, you know, physical hard infrastructure. But, but if, if we're going to achieve true levelling up across all its senses in terms of happiness and joy and quality of life, it's got to be more than that physical infrastructure investment, it's also got to be about how we invest in our communities and people and neighbourhoods. Thank you. Oh, so that's so well said. Thank you, Deborah. And, uh, and I have to say, uh, Deborah has been one of our incredible uh, board members over, over the last year and I think has really brought that uh, perspective of, um, of, of the local authority and, and how to really embed this in um, in, in the sort of bigger conversation, bigger, bigger and wider conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for that. We've got some really great questions coming up. Uh, so keep them coming. That's uh, fantastic. Um, Dan, I guess a similar question to you. Um, uh, I know, as, as many do, that you've championed sustainability at Lendley's and have already started to instigate change, I think, at the Crown Estate. How do you see the framework helping to shape developers and house builders' ambitions for new projects? Yeah, and I, I guess, um, first of all, just building on something that Deborah said, I think the period that we're living in at the moment can't be ignored because I think engagement was a, was a challenge before COVID. I think it's going to be a bigger challenge coming out of it. Uh, and and that, I mean that for everybody. Uh, and obviously there are progressive developers that really embrace this. And there's also progressive parts of the industry as well, but there's a big part of the industry that is progressive, that, that wants to get this right. But I think coming out of COVID, people are going to, I think there is a realisation that stability is something that you've got to fight for. And I, I was really interested to see this, this whole concept of control come through the framework. And I think communities and, and individuals are going to want more control over, over where they live and, and their daily lives. And, and I think the framework is empowering in that it provides a tool that's inclusive. You know, a, a single person can pick it up and use it, or big companies can, and, and that's what's wonderful about it. It's universal in that regard. 
if I asked everyone on this call what could look like, you know, everyone, everyone would have a different view. So it offers a pathway where you can work together in trying to collectively define that. Uh, and I think thirdly, what it also does is it breaks down this barrier between the design process and how communities live and work in the future. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, and when I say work, I don't mean employment, I'm talking about work as a community. What I mean by that is the design process at the moment from a developer's perspective has traditionally been you design it, then you set it free and off it goes and you hope for the best. I think what this allows for is using the design process to build a collective capacity to continuously define what it looks like as you move forward. And that's very powerful. Thank you, Dan. I think, um, you know, you're quite right. As, as Dan said, one of the things that we're trying to do through a post-occupancy review is to really um, start to... Uh, start to gather a huge amount of, of, of research and data and to actually ask those questions. You know, Dan, you're quite right. You know, this sort of sense of control. People really, I think, do, do um, are desperately, you know, they're, they're desperately keen to get involved in a really meaningful way. And I think that one of the ways they can get involved is to actually reflect not on the not just on the kind of process not just on the transactional process but but actually on the period of time that they spend within their homes within their communities and thereafter so i think it's that it's like the, you know the minute you you move into your home and you're asked that question you know would you recommend it to you know would you recommend this process to your friends? Yes, of course you would. Or, you know, 99% of people are happy when they move into their new homes. Well, that's a surprise. Um, but, you know, how, how, do we, how do we actually capture um, uh, those, um, you know, those things that really are important to us over a period of time? And how do we leverage that, uh, the, you know, that information and pull those, uh, the, as Dan, you said, those house builders, those developers who aren't necessarily um, delivering the sort, of, the, the sort of quality that we, um, we, we would expect? Um, Bridget, last, as I said, but not least. Um, so, Bridget, from, from your work on the National Infrastructure uh, Commission, and I know that you're particularly interested in how we all get about, and what we've described in the framework is movement. As, as we build new communities on the edge of towns and as we try to accommodate greater numbers of people within our cities, how can we use transport solutions to encourage places that improve people's quality of life? Okay, so I think that it comes back to some of the other aspects that you've got already in the in the framework around the and everything we're talking about about engagement uh, and about um, control. So how people move about has been a sort of stuck in aspic, if you like, over decades. We've taken decisions around that based on assuming that uh, we know where everybody's going to live and work, and then we're just kind of minimizing the, uh, the time it's going to take them to make various trips. And this is just bonkers. Because of course, uh, how, where people choose to live and where people then at least have some options about working is, is also dependent upon what that movement system is looking like. So we've been very top down about this. We've been very, um, model based around this. So we've produced all these models that nobody understands and which are entirely based on the future being like the past, instead of thinking about a much more integrated and a much more engaged version. So one of the things, as you know, you and I spent a lot of time working on the Oxford to Cambridge uh, or Cambridge to Oxford, whichever way you want to look at it, um, proposals and about how we should think about the development of the place alongside the development of the of the transport system. And I guess one of the things that came out on that is, is how traditional or how, how unimaginative, if you like, so much of development actually is. And we looked at some of the new developments around Milton Keynes and thought, no, really, still? Uh, and no thinking about not only the movement within the place, but also the movement within or the neighbourhood, within that bit of the neighbourhood and neighbouring neighbourhoods. So we're not going to get that right top down. It can only be done with the proper engagement bottom up. And I think the real, we have a quality of life uh, lens to look at things through the National Infrastructure Commission. I'm very keen that we really use the, the work that you have done and you and I together to make sure that we, that lens is really important in the next National Infrastructure Assessment. 
But one of the things also that we've been pushing in that context is the devolution agenda. And I don't think we've really yet pinned that down, us, you, anybody, as to how that works at that local level. I've just moved house. I've already been sucked into how we do the neighbourhood plan for my, this village. There are some big developments up the road. I'm now thinking, now this, how am I going to use this uh, to, help, to help us in, in our development of that neighbourhood plan? So it needs to work at all levels and, and we, need to make, we need to think of ways in which it can work at all levels. So Bridget, when you, I mean, it's a really interesting point, isn't it? That, you know, we still, we're still doing things in the same old way, you know, and I, you know, I think the cynics among us all will say, you know, we keep producing, um, you know, framework documents, um, design principles. Of course, you know, that this is a, we're trying to sort of steer away from that by having a very practical um, you know, framework that, that actually gives you know, allows people to to um, use precedence and and uh, and as a sort of helpful tool to establish that um, that sort of you know sense of control that community link. But how do you? I mean, you know, to to, to ask to sort of ask you to answer your own question. How, how you know? Do you think it is this bottom up that that that's going to make that change? Do you think that we can expect communities who've been, you know, perhaps ostracized from this these sorts of conversations in a meaningful way to really um, be able to, to sort of make make that shift not on day one no, no. these things take enormous we've been disempowering local communities for decades you turn around and say oh no look you could do this now isn't that nice and they'll go year and that's not going to make any difference so mm. it it's a question, and that's why you want the Moss Side example might be quite powerful in that, showing how in some places it really can, using those case studies, building building that community of communities, if you like, is is the way to do it bottom up. But you also need the top down. You So you yeah. need the encouragement at the top and the empowerment at the bottom, uh, and then you can begin to build momentum. Um, it won't happen overnight. And therefore, the other thing is persistence. One of the things, the only thing I've learnt in a misspent life doing policy is the only way that you win is by saying it once, twice, finding somebody else to say it in another way, somebody else to say it in this way, building that community and keeping at it. Only yeah. by keeping at it do you really, and, and, and being consistent about it. Consistency and yeah. persistency is the yeah. only way that it happens, but it takes time. Yeah, and of course, I think one of the things that the framework's been designed to do is to be actual, actually flexible and adaptable, you know, over over time, and you know, change as our knowledge and research around those six p principles develops. Um, I have a question, sort of an open question, but it might it might be um, one for either Deborah or Dan in, in particular, because the foundation is now looking to sort of deepen its knowledge in those specific areas going forward. And sort of interested to know what the priorities as you see them as we start to come out of lockdown. Dan, you talk very sort of eloquently about how, you know, now now more than ever, ever um, we are, we've, we've done a lot of kind of thinking. <laughs> I've certainly done a lot of thinking over the past year, but you know, we've come out, we're, we're different. We're different in a way uh, perhaps than we were when we went into lockdown. And Deborah, you talked very eloquently about the work that you've been doing and the focus that you, you know, that the uh, combined authority now has, you know, on recovery, on making sure that we, you know, we do build back better, build back greener, build back with a sort of more sustainably. Um, so I'll, I'll throw that question out to everybody, but, but um, perhaps uh, either of you could kick, kick off. Shall I, shall I kick off? Um, so, so I think we should. I think we should avoid falling into the trap of seeing this as influencing future developments and change, because we can't ignore the fact that too many of our people are living in environments that that aren't particularly healthy and certainly don't give them joy and don't have a quality of life that they deserve. So, so whilst of course when we're kind of building back better and looking at the future and designing new stuff, I, I, I think it would be really remiss of us not to look at what we currently have and look to see how we can make those spaces and those environments much better for people at the moment. The other thing I would say is that um, uh, 
for me it's it's also about um you know garnering and keeping that brilliant kind of uh, evidence of community engagement and volunteering that we've seen as a result of the pandemic. This real sense of community and people ha helping each other and, you know, people doing things like, you know, helping out in allotments or, you know, keeping the, the small green spaces that they've got um, kind of up and running so young children, you know, children can play on them. And, you know, so we need to really keep hold of, of that and not lose lose that as we as we come out of the pandemic. And then I think there's, there are conversations to be had with with local government, with um, uh, landowners about those small pockets of land that might be car parks at the moment, or might be you know land that's left unloved, and, and we should be having conversations about using those and giving them over to communities for communities themselves to kind of use and build and you know, create pocket parks or playgrounds for people. So, so I think there's some really interesting things and important things, actually, we should do about existing rather than just focusing on influencing the new. That's a, that's a yeah, really no, good I, point. Dan, I was going to say, how about those that unused spaces for pocket parks? <laughs> <laughs> that's a challenge. Yeah, well, well I, think, I think the... You know, we're going to all hopefully in the next few months at some stage, you know, walk out onto the battlefield the morning after the war. And I, and I do think we don't really know yet what we're going to feel. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, this is about listening. And this provides, uh, I think that's the first thing, there needs to be a lot of listening. And whatever the context, whether it's existing or whether it's new or, or, or in other applications. And I think the other thing that we can't underestimate is, you know, often... We all, many people on this call are from, from the industry, and we speak a language that a lot of com communities don't understand. And one of the, I think, most empowering things about the framework, and maybe this is also already reflecting some of the feedback that you're getting, Sadie, is that it provides a language that anybody can pick up and communicate through in order to improve the translation between real people and our industry. And that, I think, is incredibly important. So, yeah, there are, I guess, a couple of things to reflect on. I Thank think you. that's really important, the language point, the, 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 the way in which planners, the, the language of the technology, if you like, uh, is, is, is described, just doesn't engage. And, and we end up, you know, just in our own little bubbles uh, talking to, to people. And, and I think it's also, that also means that, we, that the industry comes over as, as a bit finger wagging. You know, there's a right way to do these things. Why aren't you doing it correctly? Uh, and particularly once you get out of, of urban areas with good public transport, well, A, do you feel safe on public transport? But B, actually very difficult without a car to get to a job or to uh, engage, you know, to do the, the, particularly do the linked trips around dropping the children off at school, going to work, coming back. And do, does everybody want to stay working at home for the rest of their lives? Frankly, I certainly don't, and I don't think anybody else does either. David, can you just pick up on that point? You know, we, we tried really hard, and I think you've done an excellent job at, at, at sort of taking out any of the kind of architect speak or the, you know, and ma making this a document that is really very accessible. And I just wondered if you just wanted to sort of touch upon that before, before I go um, to questions. On. There's thousands of questions. <laughs> I don't quite know how I'm going to get through them all. Oh, we're going to get through them. I'm really pleased to hear that feedback. We we tried very hard to make it not not, not just sort of jargon free, but also engaging and, and written in a way which is personable and and people can, can mm. relate to. Um, I just wanted to make a quick point, of, if I could, about um, we we wrote in the in the documents and action thing what you can do. And, and when you're writing that, first of all, you think um, some of these issues are very big for communities to deal with on their own. But more importantly, you think nowadays some of these issues are too big for local authorities to deal with um, because local authorities have been emasculated and starved of cash and actually that's the if, if you're asking what we should be doing it, it's to re-empower local authorities because they are the crucial link between communities and a lot of these issues and making things happen and it seems to me that in writing it you it was the local authority bit was always a difficult bit because you think oh they're starved of resources they don't have the capacity they're they're, they're focused entirely on adult services and so on and these issues that just don't get priority and i think that is the key thing that we could do now is to to reinvigorate that part of local government 
I can see Deborah shaking her head. <laughs> I'm not shaking, nodding, nodding, not shaking. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to some really good questions that we've got here. I'm gonna I'm going to put two two at a time up uh, in order that just to, to just to get through to get through them and also to give uh, give everybody an opportunity to to speak. So um, Claire Beanie said, "How do we practically use the framework?" So she's she's right to the nub of the issue as ever, Claire. How do we practically use the framework to bridge the very wide gulf between people's aspirations, as expressed in the framework, and the culture slash drivers of much of the house building industry? How will volume house builders feel the incentive? Now, I feel that's, that's probably one for me, but I'm not here to speak. So, um, Dan, I know you're in nowhere near a volume house builder. You are absolutely a, a developer and regeneration um, uh, uh, that sort of exemplifies good practice. But how can we as an industry, you know, what are the tools that we can use to encourage uh, those who uh, could do better to do better? Uh, I think role modelling. Uh, you know, the, the, there's so many ways I could answer this question, but I think the thing that I would say is at the moment the problem is there is so much confusion and ambiguity in this space that anyone can build a marketing campaign to tr attempt to navigate it. And, you know, we are, as, a, as an industry, knocking down things at the moment that were only put up 30, 40 years ago. And, and I think that one of the things we have to think of in the, certainly in the private sector, is that our brands and, and what communities ultimately think about us if we want to play in the sector in the long term is going to be determined by what we leave behind. And, and, we, and that's going to catch up with us. And I think, with, with this framework, if we can start to use it to demonstrate, as I said, what good looks like, but more so from a development industry perspective, then you're starting to sort of break down that ambiguity and expectations will build on what, what should happen when, when certainly the development community engages on, on this type of thing. Um, but as I said, there's so many different angles I could have answered that question through, but I think there will always be a regressive element to this. Um, what we've got to do is role model what it looks like and call out bad practice. Thank you. Would anyone else like to to um, have a go have a go at that one, Bridget? Is that your hand? I can no, see. Yeah, it is. And so I think part of the answer is um, is how we think about design codes. So one of the things which is being thought about, which was raised in the planning white paper last year, and is is being debated intensively for the, um, the, the act, the bill, and then the act, is how you think, how you incorporate design codes into the, um, the preparation of a local plan. And that, I think, will hopefully focus the minds of, of some of the developers in the sense that it will include things around public realm, it include things okay. about densities and massing and, and all of those things. Is that going to be a complete answer? No. But it actually, in, in, in terms of that sort of focusing, hopefully that will help. Thank you, David. Is that is that something you I, I want to pick up? Actually, before before I let you answer that, I'm going to throw in a, a little question as well that's uh, clearly clearly <laughs> going your way. And um, David says the design code and the uh, quality of life framework answer between them how we empower communities. Um, the difficulty is that acknowledgement of the role that can be played by local communities is largely absent from the design code. And it's, it, uh, Claire says it's essential to, build, to bridge the gulf between them, but how's that going to be achieved? I think what I actually said was that both play a role in creating what we would regard as good places, and that, that, that in turn um, creates good communities. I think the design code answers a different question which is how can we make planning policy more specific in terms of targeting at creating good places. Um, and I think, yeah, absolutely. The, um, I mean, you know, I, I know lots of volume house builders. Um, we, we have some of them as clients. They're, they're not bad people, I can tell you. Um, they actually are, on the whole, trying to do the right thing. Um, there are a number of them who are very supportive of, of the quality of life 
foundation and the framework, they work within a system which makes creating quality play really hard and one of the roles of design codes is to change the, the, the parameters of that system to make it much more the default option to create good places and um, they're working under an economic and a planning system and a highway system which does generate bad, bad quality places we know that um, and I don't think we need to win their hearts and minds I think we need to facilitate them and make it possible for them to create much better places so how you know how, how does how does that does that happen through poli I mean happen through policy happen through um, uh, leadership happen through you know why hasn't it happened we, you know we know everybody wants to do these things we know that you know when we there's not anybody who I speak to who doesn't say well of course quality of life is you know we all want to have a better quality of life and you know it's it's uh, it's the, I suppose it's the um, the age old nut that no one is it's clearly been able to crack yet. Well, policy has a big role to play, it has to be said. Um, you know, the, the, the suburban um, cul-de-sac based suburb um, came a lot out of highway, highway rules that were prevalent up until quite recently, uh, which created that type of layout. And developers will, will, will go path of least resistance. They, they will build what they know they can get permission for. And for many years, that's what was easiest to get permission for. They are also focused it's entirely upon selling houses rather than creating neighbourhoods, uh, and that's the economic system that they work under. That they, 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 their job is to churn out houses and sell and sell houses to, to customers, and that's how they make their money. They don't make money from creating mixed-use places. We have a development industry which is very sector-specific in terms of, of development, and a policy can't solve it, but policy can really help um, change mm. the policy context and change the context in which they work. So, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Dan, I'm sure when it comes to um, can you make money out of creating mixed-use communities, please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yes. And 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 I think and I think that you know I've, I'm I, you know I think that uh, you know and I've said this for many years. Community empowerment is going one way, and and I think that. Um, the path of least resistance point is right. Um, but, and I think this is going to raise the bar on the path of least resistance partially as well. The more, the more communities are empowered, the more there is to navigate. And, that's, and we've got to get better at it as an, as an industry. Our policy space needs to be there as well, because if you make it too difficult, um, we will lose investment direction uh, into mixed use and good, and good form. But, um, but ultimately, I, I see this as a good thing because communities can actually empower quite a bit by what they demand. I mean, yeah, the I think, other I thing mean, to recognise oh, is that thank you very much, communities yeah. are not negative about everything. They're not all, uh, but they've had too many bad experiences of, of having stuff dumped on them. Uh, and it's that, you know, just the sort of trying to turn that round and then working with with developers and being able to do that rather than feeling it's being done to you so that comes back to that control question means that you can uh, probably you can probably get a, an easier ride than might other than than would otherwise have been the case yeah i agree with that and that's a really important point to make you know often this conversation goes from lowest common denominator to you know what this could look like but a big part of the industry do work really well with communities. And the issue there is how do we how do we embrace new tools, how do we embrace digital so that we can improve the way we're engaging on an ongoing basis to continue to develop better? You know, and I think that, that's a point really well made. Deborah, do you, you know, do you, one of the questions here is one of the problems is that local authorities and highways authorities are frequently separate entities with separate agendas. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all very well asking the questions. And as, as Bridget says, you know, may, you know, you can, you know, communities have been burnt. They're, they're asked what they want and they seem to get delivered, um, you know, something, something outside of their existing expectations. And, you know, yes, we say perhaps it's always the fault of the developer, but actually the, co the sort of coordination that's needed to make those, you know, to, to make big, big projects work. There is a responsibility that goes to, you know, to local authorities to make sure that you, you know, you are creating the context in which that can happen. Um, I wonder if you could, I don't know, perhaps sort of speak to that, uh, speak to put his Paul Appleby sent, sent that question in. I uh, so, so the, the picture you painted is 
is right in a lot of places. One of the things we're trying to do uh, at a West Midlands level through uh, combined authority is looking at uh, regeneration of places in a, a in a, um, a socially inclusive way, so or an economically inclusive way. So, so if we are remediating brownfield land in a place, actually, there's no there's no point in simply remediating that bit of land that's been left dormant for generations and then not do anything else about it. So, in order for that to come back into play, we've got to think about how that that community that we are then going to enable to be developed can, can connect into the rest of the region. We need to be thoughtful about the kind of jobs and the skills that we provide to support that community to grow and flourish. So, so the beauty of an organization or an institution like a combined authority means that it has got the ability to bring all of those bits together to, to truly create um, a thriving, inclusive community rather than just remediate a bit of brownfield land or put a couple of bus stops up, you know, or engage with the local college about the kind of skills provision that we want them to put on. You know, we can build, um, you know, a really um, regenerative approach to places mm -hmm. and a comprehensive and, and connected uh, response to places rather than that episodic intervention that, that we're all kind of kind of responsible for and whilst we've got different levels of local government you know responsible for different bits of it you know we're all always going to get that disjointed approach whereas you know if if we can see it as as the full gambit of regeneration and all commit to working in that way in a place you know we can really see two and two equal five no, I, th I think that's a really um, a, a, such a sort of valid response about making sure that this isn't, you know, that it, it, it is about re its regeneration. It isn't mm. just about development, but it's about regeneration. Mm. Um, Claire Richards has said, I mean, you've kind of answered it, but I'm, I'm going to ask the question and maybe others would, would pitch in. And, and Claire says, it's essential we learn from who and what is already there. I think that sort of plays yeah. to your point, Deborah. You know, yeah. there are existing communities. We do need to, you know, make sure that anything, any new developments are properly knitted in. Um, and she says that's also a key to building trust and local motivation. Yeah. And how do the panel suggest we do that? So, I mean, is there anything else that you would add uh, with that question in mind to, to what to what you've just said, and perhaps others would like to pitch in on that question. Well, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the kind of urban renewal programs that were put in place a long, a long time ago, really. And, um, do, you know, I was, I was kind of involved in some of those uh, <laughs> almost 30 years ago uh, in Birmingham. And, um, you know, we were really proud of what we did around taking current or existing places and making them feel better. By, by doing things like, you know, putting in pocket parks or, you know, making uh, public transport connectivity better or giving people gardens, you know, all of those kind of things. And, you know, one of the great senses of sadness I had when I returned to the West Midlands three years ago was, you know, all that investment and all that hope and aspiration we'd put into those communities had gone because there was never that reinforcement of it and that care and that love around the environment and that, you know, enabling communities to, 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 to be um, resilient and to give them the, the kind of power of, of kind of engagement and doing it for themselves. So lots of those really brilliant schemes that we put in place were, were kind of left dormant and in rack and ruin. So, so it can't just be, we'll do this and then move on to the next thing. You've got to do it, but, but also ensure there's kind of ongoing resilience and commitment for it to be part of every, people's everyday lives, just just not this kind of um, philanthropic, you know, we'll do this bit and then move on. So, so mm -hmm. there's got to be a sense of how do you in encourage and engage and facilitate ongoing ownership by the community so they feel they've got a real stake in whatever it is uh, that you're investing in them, if that makes sense. I think that's really important. That commun that continuing resource and the continuing support has got to be important. And then there will be, you know, people will move on. The initial enthusiasm will wane. And and how do you maintain 
Uh, oh. Engagement is, is something I think that we need probably to think a lot harder about. Yeah. Uh, so that's one point. But the point I actually wanted to make, and so, so I think what Deborah said is really important, but the point, other point I wanted to make is is thinking about how the infrastructure, not, that's the social infrastructure, but how the physical infrastructure is also in place to support what people want. And, and after all, in many, many communities around the place, traffic and transport are, are, the, are the big issues. If you, if you have planning applications, it's almost always, we don't want this because of the traffic. And yet at the same time, everybody wants a car. And, and, and so how you solve and how we think together about solving both the traffic and transport, but also energy and, and, and all of those sorts of underlying uh, infrastructure questions at a community level, <clears throat> I don't think we've really, I don't think we've bottomed that out at all. Dan, for, for somebody who's who's been thinking about you know sustainable communities, uh, you know for a very long time, how, how do you, you know how do you answer Bridget's question? You know, how, how do you balance um, you know the the needs of the um, you know the sort of uh, the the infrastructure that we've known and loved for so long and le learned to require you know sort of um, rely on uh, to to actually start to integrate and create communities and, and developments that that think differently. Yeah, this the first thing I'd say is that this whole subject area is really hard, and yeah. it's not there aren't you know, any soundbite that any of us provide. I mean, it's, but one of the things I would say, and I, I guess I'm talking about when I was in the international business running Len Lisa's international business a few years ago. Every major city around the world in a different context is facing these challenges. So, for example, you know, in Sydney, if you the, the further you go out from the centre of the CBD, um, the higher unemployment is per capita, the higher obesity is per capita, the bigger the A and E wards are per capita, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the things the framework does at a, at a, at a grassroots level that I think this comes back to the, one of the fundamental challenges we face is the system everyone is trying to solve different problems for different reasons, which is why it's not joined up. And what the framework does when you read through it is it talks about this relationship between prosperity and well-being and place. We are spatial creatures and we react. And it's why, you know, when you start to correlate the data and you start to look at where is the greatest unemployment, where is where do we have the greatest health issues? Yes, there's other factors, but place is a major, major factor in, in that contribution. And I think one of the things that we need to start to debate at a local and a national level is let's get to the root cause of, of this problem and, and start to try to solve the same problem here, because whilst we're trying to solve different problems, it's going to continue to be chaos. Thank you. I think that's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of you know, one of the driving motivations for for starting the foundation was was that very you know um, that sort of that very point of you know everybody's trying to do the same thing. It's just every you know we're all doing it in different you know sort of independently of each other. And if there's a if there's a way in which we can we can, can not only collaborate but collaborate but sort of draw those. That, that, that sort of learning together and to sort of collectively work, then then you know we will inevitably find solutions and do things you know sort of quicker, um, and uh, and the outcomes will I think always be always be better if they're informed by all those different perspectives. Everybody trying to get to the same place, just doing so uh, um, together. There's a lot of questions here. Um, I think well, a certain amount of chaos is good. Chaos. What's wrong with chaos? What's wrong with people? Different people, different communities will come up with different solutions and different approaches. Is that bad? I don't think so. No, it's not. I'm not. But I'm not talking about communities. I think communities aren't the issue here. I think it's. I'm talking about the system, the the, the actors, the bigger actors. I think that um, you know, it comes back to if, if all the actors are trying to solve different problems in different ways. That's what I'm referring to. Um, so, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I want to stop that debate, but I just I do want to make sure everybody feels like their questions are being uh, are being uh, um, uh, answered. And there's a lot of questions about um, existing developments and how the framework can be applied to 
to those. So Chris uh, 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 Hageman says, how do you think that this framework applies to residential landlords working with established communities to look at ways to improve homes and neighbourhoods? So um, David, he obviously hasn't read all the case studies, but uh, perhaps, <laughs> you'd like to, <laughs> um, perhaps you'd like to uh, pick that question up. Yeah. I have to say that when we were writing it, we had in mind very much existing communities rather than new developments. It does cover new developments, but actually we're talking about communities, and of course new development doesn't yet have communities living with it. Um, and so, I mean, I, I had in mind, to be honest, the neighbourhood where I live in Wally Range in Manchester. And um, that, I, we, whenever I was thinking about things, I was thinking, well, how would we do that here? How would that work here? And this is an area which doesn't have development happening in it. It's an existing area where there's lots of tensions of living in inner city Manchester. So I think it is about existing places. Um, um, and it is about empowering existing communities. Um, I was just going to say in response to the previous discussion, I mean, we, we make the rather radical statements in the, um, in the quality of life um, framework that cars are good for your quality of life, which uh, we thought might get taken out, but it's still in there. And the reality is that for a lot of, a lot of families, a lot of, a lot of poor families, having a car is, a, is a very good for their quality of life. It allows them to get to employment of things that they wouldn't otherwise reach. The problem is with everyone has a car and get, tries to get to the same place, then it's bad for our collective quality of life and for air pollution and for congestion and so on. So there's also that tension in there. It's about the individual quality of life and the community quality of life. I think, you know, I, th I think that sort of push and pull and, you know, what's good, what's good for us as individuals as opposed to the collective is is a tension that is incredibly difficult to unpick and I suppose goes to Dan's you know point earlier which is that actually there's some really big issues some really tricky issues and um, that that actually need to be solved on a much more strategic level rather than pushing the responsibility down to the individual which I think is often happens when it's like oh you shouldn't have you know maybe you shouldn't have three cars but you know um, you know can you really survive in this situation without the one car um, mm. I have, uh, this is a bit mean, but I have, a, I, have a, I have a question here that I'm going to pop to Bridget. Naomi Cleaver says, in, the, in this budget week, is there a case for tax relief for developers equal to quality of life credits, given that a better quality built environment can ameliorate demands on the welfare state? Oh, that's true. <laughs> Well, it's it's a great question, which I'm in, incompetent to answer. Um, but oh. uh, because my my the, the difficulty with it is, yes, is, is is there is indeed a case. My worry would be that by the time the Treasury has defined quality of life credits and and what the value of these would be and whether they're additional and what the dead weight is and the displacement is, we'll all have spent a huge amount of time and achieved sweet FA. <laughs> That, that is my that's my kind of worry about about these uh, these kind of qualitative things, but it's certainly worth chucking it out there yeah. and, and having it go. There's, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to be mean enough to throw that to anyone else, <laughs> knowing that Bridget's the economist amongst us. But there's lots well, of questions. Sorry, here. Can, I, can I just say oh, one on. one thing really really Let's quickly see. on it? I think. Two, two things. It's I mean, because it's another developer question. I think the um, one of the things that I would say, because I completely agree with what Bridget just said. Completely agree with what she just said. One of the things that I would say: someone owns someone owns these places. Someone. Sometimes it's a community. Sometimes it's international investors, and sometimes in between people in between. Um, and there is a growing movement to um, separate from you know formal measurement criteria to ask for these types of things. Um, as a resilience measure to the investment. And I think capital is going to be asking for this more and more, and I think that's going to have a big, a big impact. The, the, the last thing I wanted to say very quickly was I don't see new developments and existing, um, uh, existing um, uh, contexts as being... They are different, but they're not as different as we, as we may think because quite often in this country, developments usually occurring within an existing area and and we and I don't think we 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 get the benefit of the ripple effect of developments. And I think this framework has an opportunity for us to actually blend a lot better new with existing, which which we don't do very well at the moment. No, I, th I well, obviously, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I don't know if anyone else wants to pitch in before I I ask the last couple of uh, 
questions. Would, any, would anybody like just to respond to that point? No, okay, well, there's, just to there's agree been a lot of, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's been a lot of sort of questions about, um, you know, do, do the, do the, um, do the quality of, does the quality of life framework turn into sort of standards? And it, uh, David uh, Feeney says, these principles need to be constantly applied through national policy and legislation and a joined up view being, ta uh, view being taken is all too fragmented to, and a, sorry, and a, and a joined up view being take is all too fragmented to be mainstreamed. So from a planning perspective, the planning white paper is silent on much of this. What is the panel's view? Um, that there's one question. I don't know, um, Bridget, if you want to respond to that. Um, or David, if you want to talk about the sort of tension between putting a, a framework to, you know, putting a framework together and in, uh, one that tries to encourage as opposed to the sort of legislative policy stick. Um, you know, where, where do we sit on that? Is this, you know, what's your, when, you were, when you were doing both, if you like, when you were involved in both, how, how, do, you, how do you see this, sits a, this how do you see the, the framework in the future perhaps, you know, turning into policy? Uh, well, I think it's very much, I mean, when we were writing it, if we got to the point where we said, well, and you need to change national policy to make a difference here, then we thought we've gone down the wrong route. We want to actually think about what we can do locally. Um, and so we try to focus on what you can do as communities or councils or developers within the powers they have at the moment to make a, make a difference here. Um, but you're right that the, the context in which that, that works is re really, really important. And actually, policy framework, the funding framework, is the thing that allows those things to happen. So we shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't wait for the world to change before we try and change the world. But we should um, We should be still trying to make that, that, that wider change. Uh, Bridget was saying earlier about bottom-up transport. When we talk about active travel, for example, um, the big thing about cycling, for example, is, is cycle lanes, segregated on-street cycle lanes. That is not something communities can create themselves. There, there is, you know, communities don't have the power to do that. Local authorities do. And so the, it's important to have both bottom-up and top-down combined. And when they join together in the middle, then you can get really real things happening. Brilliant. Thank you. Related we have... to that, there's a big question about this policy and legislation stuff, and that's an active debate in the Planning Act. What should be... Because once it's a legislative framework, the, the risk is it becomes too rigid. Policy is easier to change than the legislative framework. On the yeah. other hand, if you really want, you know, to push it, then you need some kind of, of, of legislation. Uh, and I think that that's a tension which is not yet properly, is not resolved. And incidentally, just on cycle lanes, that's great for the cyclists, but pedestrians are then very scared. Okay, before we go into the cycle versus pedestrian debate, I'm going to thank my panel members and ask them to ask answer one last question. And as we only have two minutes, I think that's 30 seconds each. So panelists, if there is um, what single change to government or business would you make tomorrow that would improve people's quality of life for the long term? That's a bit of a mean one, but... Deborah, can you would you kick us off on that one? And then I'm going to go to Dan, and then I'm going to go to Bridget, and then David. Uh, I think it's about investing more in community ownership and uh, investing more in supporting communities to give them the resilience and enabling them to take advantage of that. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you, Dan. Uh, I think Deborah said it more eloquently, but I was going to say control, you know, governance, <laughs> influence, engagement, proper engagement, absolutely. Bridget. Uh, enabling local Not authorities to employ... Sorry, go on. Enabling local authorities to employ planners who are also given support and training to take a bigger... to take a, a broader view. Yeah. Brilliant. And David? The problem with going last is everyone's taken all the good ones, isn't it? Um, I, I, I was out working in, in the street on Saturday, and I, I, there were so many people around. It's, ironically, the pandemic has created this huge surge in community and community optimism, and I want to bottle that and actually um, use it as a power of force going forward. 
Okay, fantastic. In the in the final minute, I'd just like to thank you all so much uh, to the panelists, to all of you coming today for your incredible questions. Um, I'm so thrilled and excited uh, to uh, be publishing uh, the framework document. And I'd just like to say, please, please uh, help us, support us, uh, take the message away and uh, share it. And if you'd like to become a partner or associate with the Quality of Life Foundation, please do get in touch um, because we are, we're here for the long term and we really do want to do everything we can to uh, improve people's quality of life. And if I, we can take you on the journey with us, uh, that would be incredible. So thank you again and uh, have a wonderful rest of day. Thank you. Bye -bye, thank folks. you for great chairmanship. That was yeah, terrific. Thank so you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.